Um, and I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a heavy economics talk. And so in, in the interests of giving you a little bit of uh, light relief, I thought I'd start off with a little amusing slide. I was um, down in Australia recently, and we visited some seed stock operations down there. And this is um, Tamania Angus. And I think, Mark, you'll agree that the seed stock producers in Australia really take their business pretty seriously. And, and so I'd like to challenge the seed stock producers in the audience. Uh, this is a car that was parked around the corner from my mum. Um, and they had uh, black Angus, and look at that, leading the way to, in Angus bull breeding, <laughs> painted right there on their car. So next time I come to Mark, I want something along those lines to show how much you uh, believe in your seed stock breeding. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this morning. I'm interested in the economics of using DNA technologies on commercial ranches. So not for seed stock selection, but rather on commercial ranches. And I was interested in looking at the value of using um, DNA tests to make replacement heifer selection decisions on commercial ranches. And so I'm going to briefly go through kind of the way I approach this, which is what traits are of importance for heifer replacement selection, what selection criteria are producers currently using, what traits are genomic predictions available for, and what's the value of the genetic improvement in commercial females. So let me ask the group here, what traits are of importance in heifer replacement selection? Fertility, for sure. Disposition. When you're making your selection decisions, you might be able to choose disposition. Fertility, you're probably not too sure about. What are most producers going to be basing their decisions on? Size. <laughs> yep, pretty much. <laughs> Is she big enough to breed that first season? And also, is she phenotypically structurally sound? Has she got good udder? So that's, at least in my experience when I'm watching it, there's maybe you have 100 animals in your cow herd. You'll get 45 heifers alive to select from. And there's already a group that's been removed because they were born too late, and they're not going to get big enough, irrespective of their genetic merit. So you narrow down to a pool of maybe 30 of which you may be selecting 20, depending on your kind of replacement rate. There's not a lot of mo movement room to wriggle there. But if there was, then in a perfect world, you'd love to select on reproductive traits. And because they're sex limited, they're lowly heritable, and some are expressed quite late in life, they're absolutely perfect traits for what we've heard the promise of DNA can deliver, and that is to give you good estimates on these traits that you can't easily get uh, good genetic estimates on when the animals are young. So that would be ideally what we would like to have. We'd like to have an EPD for age at first calving, for reproductive success. Maybe we, we have, for, with the talk this morning, don't, don't have Y chromosomes in there and to um, the, at the replacement rate. So they're the types of traits we'd like to have information on. So I was looking at some literature that was put out by um, Igenity, and, and this is a commercial producer who's basically saying that he's raising his own replacement heifers, um, and he's just basically making phenotypic observations on those heifers in order to make um, his selection decisions. And he really doesn't have any other information that he's using to base that information on. So what information is available in the genetic tests that are currently out there? Well, there's two tests, as you well know. I probably don't need to go that through that with this audience. Um, there's a number of tests in here, some of which relate to female traits, or what you might call reproductive traits, and some that relate to all of the other traits that are of importance um, when you're talking about economics. And then the other product that's out there um, has a number of different traits, some of which are important to reproductive um, or at least maternal traits like milking ease, uh, excuse me, milk production. Um, but the traits that are actually going into genetic evaluations at the moment really are focused more on carcass traits and um, growth traits, a little bit um, here on docility in one of them and average daily gain. So if we look at the um, and they're just, we've already gone through that. I'm in the interest of time, I'll just go through this fairly quickly. But they're the traits that are currently getting incorporated into cash, national cattle evaluation in the Angus herd, Angus breed. If we look at the traits, then I guess that I would say are maternal traits, they're kind of the dark black traits on this particular line. Um, there's really not a lot of that that's going into genetic evaluations at the current time, and a number of the traits that I mentioned earlier that we'd like to have EPDs on, 
they really don't exist at the moment. We don't have um, EPDs for some of the, the maternal traits, uh, age at first calving, for example. It's just not something we have available to even select upon. Um, and I would argue that um, when you're making your replacement heifer selection decisions, it shouldn't just only be about what works well for replacement heifers, but also for everything that is important to the entire production system. And this gets back a little bit to Matt's earlier comment about the more information we get, the more we're going to have to have some sort of an index to appropriately rate, weight how much selection emphasis we should put on reproductive traits versus carcass traits versus growth traits. Because if you're selecting your heifers, for example, only on reproductive traits, um, and they have horrible growth traits and carcass traits, overall, that's not going to be moving the industry in a good direction. And, and I don't know, in the absence of an index of some sort, how one would go around and weight all of these traits, uh, let alone some of these new traits that are coming in where you're getting identity scores, for example, on, on these. How much should you give to mature height relative to heifer pregnancy, relative to calving ease, relative to birth weight? Can someone answer me that question? Um, I think it's pretty hard to do that. And so because it's hard to do that in the real world, I did what all good economists do, and I just made up my own imaginary world. Um, and that's what I'm going to be discussing today. And I'm going to basically discuss um, an example I gave to you last year where I was looking at the value of um, using DNA to increase the accuracy of commercial sire selection. And when I went through that example, for those of you that weren't here, it was a very, very trivial exercise just to determine all of the following uh, pieces of information in order to get some sort of an economic evaluation of uh, the, the the value of DNA testing for a commercial sire uh, selection. And I'm being a little bit facetious, but I guess my point is I can pretty much make the value of this test whatever it is you want it to make me by just altering my assumptions here. And it really is going to be very in, uh, specific to a particular uh, operation as to what the relative value is. So what I've done is, is kind of modelled a herd that to my best estimate is kind of what I've seen some people doing in the real world. You can disagree with it, but that's pretty much what I ended up doing. So here's my perfect world. What I'm trying to do is estimate the value of using DNA test information to increase the accuracy of both bull and replacement, uh, replacement heifer selection in a commercial herd. So I'm looking at the expected returns from using DNA testing to improve the accuracy of selection for both commercial sires sourced from a seed stock herd and replacement commercial heifers. I went through the sire equation last year. Today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the replacement commercial females. But I will go, touch on the sire uh, aspect first because I want to contrast it with uh, what happens when we move into replacement heifers. So here's my um, perfect world. Uh, so the following commercial herd operation was modelled. I had 100 cows in my commercial herd and I'm getting 45 heifer calves and 45 bull calves every year. I'm testing all 45 of my heifer calves in, to, to, as my selection criteria. And I'll tell you what DNA test I'm using in a minute. And then I'm keeping 20 to re as replacements each year. So that's you know, in ballpark of around about um, a selection intensity of, of, of 0.8 because it's about 50%. I mean, no doubt five of them are going to have bad udders or bad legs or something. So I'm really not going to have them even available to select from. Um, in, in the sire part of the equation, I've got a sire who's out there for four breeding seasons, um, which rarely happens, at least in my commercial ranch project. If they last that long, it's unusual. Um, I've got a cow to bull ratio of 25. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of economic um, assumptions you have to make to, in order to make this all uh, pencil out. Basically, the bottom line for the cows, which is really the important part for this, uh, this model, is that I culled all my cows when they got to 10 years of age. So that if they lasted that long, they could have nine calves. But they were dropping out at a certain rate each year. Um, and likewise, the bulls were doing the same, but they, they were only around for four years. So given all of those assumptions, then I had to have some sort of an index upon which I was going to use to value the value of, of an improvement in, in genetic gain. And what I did was used um, the, the um, breed plan indexes from the Australia. And this is basically a feedlot index that's been derived uh, using a, a program called Breed Object in, in Australia. 
Um, four, a self-replacing herd, which means it, it, it's a herd that's keeping its own replacement heifers. Um, and this is the relative weighting of their, what they call their economically relevant traits. It's the breeding objective or a weighting of the relative economic uh, traits. And what you can see here, you know, simply here, the t marbling score is, is quite a big profit driver in this particular index, as you might imagine when you're taking it, and this is a whole industry um, index, so it's looking at the value that's derived by all of the different sectors of the, the beef industry. Um, so that there's 24% for marbling score, but then down here you see there's some um, replacement or, or cow-calf um, traits that are of importance, things like cow survival rate, you want to put a negative emphasis on cow weight, you, you know, there's some emphasis on calving ease direct and calving ease maternal. Basically what this is saying is how much relative emphasis you should give to these different profit drivers. Um, and it's all done with a, with a program in the background. And it's quite hard, I think, if you don't have a good feel for, for those, where your profit drivers are coming from, it, to appropriately weight the different traits that are available in the EPDs um, that we have facing commercial producers. And I think Matt put up the slide of, of all the different EPDs that are out there. So I took the cheats way out and, and used this particular index. And what I did was I created my own DNA test and I had this fantastic training population um, that was willed to me. And it was basically a training population of either 1,000 animals or 2,500 animals, which had um, basically, if I had, which had phenotypic information on all of the traits that are in the selection objective. So I had ab absolute measurements of sale live weight, um, direct, I had cow weaning rates, cow survival rate. I had, uh, so all of those traits I had phenotypes on and then all of the phenotypes on what's more, real, more realistic in the real world, and that is what, what I'll call here the selection criteria, um, and that's things that, that you probably more typically would have information on. And if I had 2,500 animals that had phenotypic information on all of these traits, um, then the, the um, proportion of genetic variation that I would be expect to explain is approximately equal to the heritability. So what I mean by that is I had 2,500 animals to train on, then I would um, explain about 31% of the genetic variation in sale live weight, for example. So the higher the heritability, the more um, the higher the genetic correlation. And that's, that's generally true. What that pretty much tells you is if you have a low heritability trait like calving is direct, you're going to need way more than 2,500 records to get that up into the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 level that we'd like to see things in. So basically what that says is low heritability traits are going to need thousands of animals to get reasonable accuracies. So my, my 2,500 is what I call my high accuracy test. And if I only trained on a thou only trained on a thousand animals, it would give you about half that value. So you'd explain about 15% of sale live weight direct um, and, and so on. So does that make sense to everyone? So they were, they're imaginary tests and they're very powerful tests. I don't know of anyone that has um, access to records on all of the traits that make up the actual economically relevant traits. It's quite an artificial situation. It's the very best of all worlds. But it, in my imaginary world, I can do these things. So when I used that particular um, criteria and I went through and valued uh, commercial sire selection where I used the test to improve the accuracy of um, a, an entire calf drop and then selected the best half of those bulls. It penciled out to bottom line about $170 per test for the intermediate accuracy test and about $282 per test for the high accuracy test. Now I want to point out that that's per DNA test. So per bull that was actually selected, the, the, the value was about, he was bringing in about $340 more in, in value as a result of him being genetically superior that was being brought back into the, the value chain. Um, and likewise, this bull was bringing in about $500 more in terms of his genetic improvements contribution to bringing value back to the value chain. I did mention this was a whole industry index, um, and so this next slide 
kind of breaks down where that value was derived. Um, and let me just go back here. I'm saying all of these traits that are in green here are kind of traits where um, the value is being derived by the cow-calf operation, if you will. Um, things like cow weight and cow survival rate is, is, is value that's coming back to the cow-calf producer. And what I would um, put here, what did we call this, calf scour tan? Um, this is all kind of value that's going back to the processing sector. That is value that's being derived by the, by the processor. And if you look at the breakdown of where the genetic gain is, um, this is the, the uh, accuracy when you have no DNA testing going on. So that's just regular performance recording in this case. This is the, the jump you get. This is, remember I said that the intermediate DNA test increased the value of a commercial bull by about $300. You can see some of that value is going back to the processor and some of that value is going back to the producer. So in other words, the DNA test is improving, um, you know, marbling score a little bit here perhaps, and that's bringing value back to the processor. And likewise, the high value test is bringing back quite a bit of um, return to the processor, which doesn't, is not that unexpected in a feedlot index where a lot of the selection emphasis was on processor traits like marbling score, and it's bringing back a little bit of value to the producer. But if you're not in a vertically integrated system like this, where you're deriving the value and it's, it's all being meshed together, there's only a very small amount of that um, you know, $282 or $170 that's actually being derived by the cow-calf person. And so if you wanted to actually invest in this test um, and you weren't getting all of the processor value included in, in the money you had available to invest in the test, it's, it's much smaller amount of money that you'd have available to, to pay for that test. So that's the bull scenario. So let me just now touch on the heifer um, scenario. So the assumptions I had to make was that um, the value of using DNA information in making this, the replacement selection uh, decisions for heifers really depends on the information you have available at the time you're making that selection, which generally is sometime after weaning and before breeding. Um, and uh, the accuracy of the test with regard to whatever your selection objective is. And then finally, the selection intensity. What proportion of those available heifers do you have to make selection on such that you can get rid of the ones that didn't do well and keep the ones that did do well? If you haven't got a lot of room to move there, doesn't matter if you test them or not because you really aren't going to change what you're doing. You're going to keep the same 20 that you were going to take in the first place. So all of those play into it. So in my particular situation, I modelled the break-even cost of testing these 45 potential replacement heifers um, and keeping 20. So that was what my, my assumptions was. And I assumed that the commercial producer was keeping no records at all on the heifers. Well, that's a bit unlikely. I mean, he'd probably at least look at them and see if they looked bigger than the other one, but um, that was at least the, my assumptions that I made in order to do that. And to cut a long story short, and the bottom line is, um, what you're looking at is the rate of how much the DNA tests, which are very powerful, would improve the genetic gain that's coming back from that replacement heifer selection decision. And the value is dramatically smaller than we see for the bulls. And the reason for that is that a, a, a female doesn't produce that many offspring um, relative to a bull. And so you have a lot more progeny that a bull is producing relative to a female from which to derive the value of that improved genetic um, gain. And so the, this, this is about, in general, I've, I've done a couple of different modelings, the value is always under $10 um, in terms of how much de value you can get derived back from uh, doing this test in terms of the increase in the genetic gain in your replacement heifers in the, in the commercial sector. Now that would be a different value proposition in the seed stock sector where you're going to have a lot more offspring coming from that seed stock female from which to derive value and so that the, the value is going to go up there. So basically, um, you know, the, the value of increasing the accuracy of commercial replacement heifers is a lot less than it's going to be for bulls. Um, and I think that doesn't matter if you're talking about DNA testing or phenotyping in general. Um, you want to spend more time doing the bulls because you're going to have a lot more genetic descendants from those bulls and a lot more opportunity to derive 
value from it, and so it just makes economic sense to do um, more phenotype recording and DNA testing on the bulls than the heifers. And I'm going to leave it at that, Matt, in the interest of keeping you on, well, not too much more behind on time. So I'm happy to take questions.